This is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Diversity and Spirituality Network is an emerging community of people who are exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. We all have different opinions as to what that looks like, but for me personally, I see what people call diversity as nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. If you'd like to know more about us, please visit our website, diversityandspirituality.com. Today, I'm privileged to interview Jess Letterman, who's the author of the new novel, Heart Set Free. In addition to writing that book, he also manages a website devoted to the writings of George MacDonald, which is worksofmcdonald.com, which also sponsors publications of books by Christian authors. He has a degree in music from Christian University, and is also an acclaimed finance writer who's published over 40 books on the global finance markets. Jess, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Angelo. Pleasure to be here. Jess, I'd like to start with kind of a standard question for me. Tell me a little bit about your own um, religious or spiritual upbringing. Or or lack thereof. Or lack Uh, thereof. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I was raised in a nominally Jewish, really a secular uh, home. Um, it was an environment dominated by, uh, by science and, and uh, uh, scientists uh, who I hung around uh, in, my, in my youth. Uh, and while certainly many scientists are religious, spiritual people, uh, the ones I grew up around uh, were not. And my, my foolish error, though, was really in, in imitating their, their, their arrogance. I, uh, as, as I was growing up, I, I believe, I thought believers were fools. And the existence of, of so many competing religions, hundreds, really thousands, right, uh, as a, a prima facie evidence that they must all be wrong. And, you know, I thought of myself as a creative young man, but uh, as I look back on it, I think my atheism showed a, a real lack of imagination and intellectual curiosity. And uh, some of the irony, I was thinking about this the other day, one of my earliest memories as a very young kid uh, was sometimes just having my, feel like my mind was spinning, thinking about just the sheer amazement of the fact that I existed, Mm. right? And and certainly one of the, the common grounds of all the major uh, major uh, religions is this fundamental question of why is there anything? Why did wh- why does anything exist? Right. Uh, so uh, here I had this clue as a young child and and went nowhere with it. And in fact, then uh, I uh, I'll take it up to uh, when I went to college and one of my professors told me says uh, who knew I was an atheist said you know Jesse your name in fact means God exists. That's the meaning of the Hebrew name Jesse. I thought, oh, okay, you know, fine. You, know, you, you, got, you scored a point, I guess, but so what? <laughs> uh, and, and, and did nothing with that. So there's, uh, that's my, uh, my spiritual. Well, uh, let, let's uh, take it years. back a little bit. You know, it's, it's quite a statement to declare yourself an atheist in general. Mm-hmm. You know, and most people, they just, maybe they won't say anything if they're non-believers. So you took that step. I mean, for me, the step at my young age, I declared myself an agnostic for one mm-hmm. point. But you, you what, what was it that you said, you said, I am an atheist? What, what was that about? Well, it, it really was not a, um, uh, a, a well thought out, uh, you know, intellectual um, uh, position, but really more a question of hubris, of, of, uh, a superficial arrogance that says believers are, are, are dumb. Um, how, you know, all these people uh, believing what to me uh, on a very superficial level were contradictory uh, views about this imaginary uh, uh, God or gods uh, and must be, must, must be false. And so rather than at least take a more, a more measured or honest uh, intellectual stance of agnosticism, uh, it was. It was to. It was to say, no, no, I'm. I'm an atheist. You guys are fools, and and uh, there is no God. Um, 
so, you know, I, I really think purely as a matter of ego. Now, I, I, I suppose I should say at the outset, um, Jess, that um, I have not read your book. I read the first two chapters and it was wonderful. <laughs> it really, but I'm, I'm not a big fiction reader, you know, uh, in general. Uh, I tried. I, I, th I thought I should do my homework and read the whole 300 and some pages um, of the book. And I, I guess I'm going to use the, the kind of the line from um, Larry King. I'm going to decide based on this interview whether I'm going to complete the whole thing. But I, I wanted oh. to just tell you that, even though I, I know the primary purpose of us is to talk about hearts. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I should put that out there, though, for you. So... I really get the, get the impression that a lot of your becoming a Christian um, had to do with reading various, various, various folks. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got a background as a, uh, I mean, you're, 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 you're established in the finance world. I mean, you're, you're no slouch when it comes to that. Had to do with the, the development, as I understand it, of mortgage-backed securities and things of that nature. I'm, I'm, I may be, mis and here you are, all of a sudden, you've, you've become a Christian. It's like, this is your passion. This is your life now. You've got a website. Um, based on not the not the fiction writer McDonald, who I thought it was like the detective writer when I first. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> but, so uh, I'm just I'm just curious how how you, how how you, what led you to become a Christian? Yeah. Um, well, uh, as some other great some other uh, uh, writer once once wrote, midway through my life's journey. Um, and I'm hoping it's midway because I was around 50 years old. Uh, my uh, my wife, uh, and, and let me say, I'll back up for a second and say that one of the of the uh, primary characters in Heart Set Free, a character by the name of Joan Reed, is modeled on my late wife uh, Terry, and who had, when she was very young, had a, a, a blissful uh, faith, uh, which she lost. Um, uh, she became an a, a, a atheist for much better reasons than than I did. She lost her faith uh, due to close up encounters with intense hypocrisy. Let me put it that way. It wasn't um, your influence, at all. Uh, no, this was uh, when she went. She went to a, uh, a, a quote unquote Christian uh, college, uh, really run by sort of a cult leader type, uh, who. Um, um, was such a was such an outrageous hypocrite that uh, it really led to her to completely losing her faith. And when I met her, uh, we were both atheists, and we. Um, but she was uh, she was always a student of philosophy, and 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 as a result, was um, much much more open minded. And one day, uh, she was listening to an interview on PBS. Uh, with Francis Collins. He had just published a book called The Language of God. And Francis Collins um, is an interesting guy. He's, he was head of the, of the U.S. team that, uh, of the, the Human Genome Project, when you might remember back in the, in the previous decade, uh, the two teams that were racing to decode the human genome for the first time in, in history. And uh, he then became, um, uh, he, he's a very, very prominent scientist, biologist, uh, and uh, he had written a book called uh, The Language of God, which was about the race to decode the human genome on the one hand, but also the fact that he had been an atheist and became a devout Christian, uh, uh, thanks very much to the writings of C.S. Lewis. Well, Collins is a, a very humble guy, and he quoted extensively from Lewis. He figured he can't write as well as Lewis, just quote Lewis, <laughs> and, and, there, and he'll do everyone a great favor. Okay, well. So my wife uh, was so impressed with this interview on the radio that we bought the book uh, and uh, read it. And we said, wow, this Lewis guy uh, is, is amazing. Uh, and we bought everything that C.S. Lewis had, uh, wow. uh, had ever written. And you now needless to say, with my background of having been so influenced by uh, growing up by scientists, I was impressed by the fact that Collins was a scientist. I had n really never... Um, uh, thought much about the fact that so many great scientists uh, have been deeply religious men. And, you know, for all the bad rap that the Catholic Church gets about uh, its attitude towards science, uh, many eminent scientists were, in fact, uh, priests. Anyway, um, so we started reading C.S. Lewis, and Lewis really provided the, the intellectual underpinning of, um, 
uh, for my becoming a Christian. Uh, many people, I think, have been influenced by his his wonderful work, Mere Christianity. But really, his whole opus was was uh, astounding. And Lewis made no secret of the fact that his great inspiration was a man, a, a 19th century man by the name of George MacDonald, a Scotsman. And I said, wow, well, if Lewis was so influenced by MacDonald, we better buy everything that Mac George MacDonald wow. ever wrote, <laughs> which turned out to be 50 volumes that <laughs> showed up in, <laughs> in, in several large boxes. And the combination of Lewis and MacDonald, I'm hardly alone. I'll tell you, if you interviewed enough people who became Christians, uh, not necessarily, you know, from their from their youth, uh, you'd find quite a few, I think, who um, hit on Lewis and then uh, through Lewis, George MacDonald. Through MacDonald is really where I discovered the, the loving father heart of God, the fatherhood of God being central to MacDonald's understanding of scripture. And, and you know, Everyone knows that the, the Apostle John, uh, you know, has, has famously said, God is love. So there's a couple of ways to think about that. One is a sort of like a hippie sort of thing. God is love, man, um, and, and, and no, not go anywhere with it. And the other is to say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> no, this is a fundamental truth statement about who God is that you use as a guide to understanding Scripture, because contrary to what some might say, Scripture does not necessarily explain itself. So the other th thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about George MacDonald is that from him I learned that faith, what, is, what does it mean to have faith? It's not a matter of intellectual concurrence, saying, okay, I believe that there's a God. I believe Jesus Christ um, is the Son of God. It's nothing less, faith is nothing less than the willed obedience to, to the Lord. Now, McDonald was not Eastern Orthodox. I don't even think he necessarily was familiar with Eastern Orthodox writings, but I think he would have heartily agreed with a line that I'll quote from uh, a book called The Orthodox Way uh, that, that um, I, I heartily recommend. He says, you know, we are called to reproduce on earth the mystery of mutual love, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in heaven. That is Oh, that's faith. That's obedience to God, reproducing on earth the love that exists eternally between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Living that out. Love not as a, some sort of gooey emotion in your heart, but lived out in practice in, in everyday life. So that's, um, that is uh, the way that I came to Christ uh, through Lewis and McDonald. So let me let me ask you this. This is not on our little script of agreed questions, but I don't think you have a problem with it. Um, <laughs> you know, you're you're basically describing um, uh, I'll call it a mental intellectual process of becoming a Christian, and I'm sure there was more to it than that. If you talk to a lot of um, I'll call them fundamentalist believers, let's say, and not I don't mean to even denigrate them. They all they, for for them it's more of an emotional process. They use words like born again and things of that nature. So, um, yes, I understand that you, you, a lot of these great thinkers be influenced you from a mental level. What was the emotional aspect of it for you? It's, it's a great question because uh, one of the things that I often point at is that nobody comes to faith through a purely intellectual process. And that's the great flaw, I think, when people uh, try to make intellectual proofs uh, about God or to say, look, look at all this evidence. How can you not believe that, you know what? It's not, it, people can always come up with some counterclaim. So ultimately, ultimately it is um, something that is, is at an emotional or even, I don't even know, if, I don't know the right word. Here I am a writer, but I'm, I'm grasping for words because even a God, uh, is if he exists is is exists on on a on a transcendent level he is the 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 basis of all of all reality and we feel that we experience that reality inside of us uh, i know i did and that's where i said you know lewis was the was the intellectual argument i read mere christianity and he said i can't argue with any of this this all makes sense but you're still sitting you know, outside the party, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and it was it was McDonnell that that brought me into the intense emotional um, uh, spiritual uh, war, uh, place where you say, ah, I know. Um, mm -hmm. This is it's not a matter of it's not mathematics. It's there's no equation where you where you can solve for x. It's it's something deeper uh, deeper than that. And and frankly, you know, I I, I wouldn't have gotten there without um, without my wife, um, uh, my late wife Terry, um, because it's not a journey. You know, no one's a a, a solo uh, a Christian. Um, I suspect that this is this is true. Probably, uh, I'm sure of all of the the major uh, beliefs. It is um, we are we're we're, we're part of a, of a community as a, a journey that my late wife and I went on uh, together uh, and uh, experienced emotionally uh, together. So um, a lot of people that listen to this will have no idea who, who anything about this George McDonald fellow who, who, who clearly had a, a deep influence on you. Just can you give me just sort of a flavor of the man? Sure, Angelo. Uh, McDonald uh, lived during the Victorian era, 19th century. Uh, and uh, did many things. He was trained in, in science as well as uh, having studied uh, theology, was a minister for a number of years, although his views were considered uh, a bit too radical for, his, uh, uh, for the congregation that he had. Uh, he, was, he is known as the father of modern uh, fantasy literature. He's probably best known uh, for a number of his children's, uh, nominally children's books, uh, adults benefit greatly by reading them, At the Back of the North Wind, The Princess and the Goblin, um, Princess and Curdie, um, The Wise Woman, uh, and um, uh, wrote many uh, so-called realistic novel, adult novels. Um, so a, a man who uh, also was is well known uh, for his for his, his passionate um, uh, belief in the goodness of God. He was someone who today would be would be considered a believer in uh, universal uh, reconciliation. Uh, he fought against that. really uh, yeah, and he he really in some ways rebelled against the very harsh Calvinist doctrines that were prevalent in Scotland uh, when he was growing up. So we're here to talk. I'm, I want to help you promote your book here. Um, um, <laughs> seriously. Um, so can you give me some sense as to how um, maybe McDonald or, or some of the, because I, I, I really have the sense that you, you worked out a lot of your beliefs as you were writing this book. That's probably um, um, probably like a shorthand, not totally accurate. Um, but that's the sense that I got because a lot of the, your ideas about Christianity live in this book. So um, give me a sense of your process for writing it and maybe how some of these, these maybe conclusions of McDonald and some of the others that influenced you. Live sure. In live. Sure. Uh, well, my, my intent in writing Heart Set Free was, you know, first and foremost was to tell a captivating story. Um, and uh, I, I, the idea for it was born um, after uh, not long after my wife uh, passed away, we were uh, living in uh, Alaska at that time. And in fact, the novel, as you know, having read the first chapter, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that it begins in um, the Alaska Territory in 1925. Uh, I lived uh, not very far from uh, the Iditarod Museum, you know, the the iconic uh, dog sled race. Uh, which is based on something that was called the Great Race of Mercy uh, in uh, 1925. Diphtheria broke out in Nome, Alaska, and in, in the middle of the winter, only way to get there and save the population with the, the serum uh, was by dog sled. Only trouble is it was, you know, minus 60 degrees uh, uh, in, uh, you know, black night, 24 hours a day. Um, how do you do that? So that's the sort of dramatic setting in which the novel uh, begins. But, you know, 
there's nothing more thrilling to me than matters of doubt and faith and mm -hmm. how they shape our lives. And um, the uh, one of the the um, the things about about this book is that you know it's not a set of apologetics for a one particular way of of looking at God, it now it's it's certainly dominated by a, a, a Christian um, point of view, uh, but uh, represents a, a, a number of um, re religious traditions um, uh, within Christianity and even beyond uh, Christianity. You know, a diversity of I was thinking about your your uh, your your uh, your podcast and a, a, a diversity of religious uh, traditions. Um, uh, Lewis influenced me a lot when he, he makes a, a tremendously important point uh, that has always stuck in my mind. He says that, uh, okay, as a Christian, scripture tells us that no man can be saved except through Christ, but it does not say that only those who know him can be saved by him. So, so um, you know, Christianity, like like every one of the great theistic traditions, whether you're talking about the, the, the Muslim tradition, Islam or Judaism or Hinduism or Sikhism um, believe that God is the source of reality. So to say that you can't be saved except through Christ is, is really no different than saying you can't get to Wednesday except through Tuesday. I mean, it's, that's just, just the way it is. Now, two of the, of the main characters in Heart Set Free, Luke and Yura, who you met in chapter one, are native Alaskans. And, um, and uh, their uh, mother and son, and the mother is a, a, a carver of the Inuit gods. Um, and I, I, I did a lot of research on, uh, on the Inuit gods when I was up in Alaska. And one of the things that, uh, um, and I talk a little bit, of, uh, more than a little bit about them in Heart Set Free, and I think this is a, a good example of some of the connections that you see between what might seem apparently very, very different faiths around the world uh, can be found in, uh, I was fascinated by the god Sila, who was god of the wind and referred to as breath of the world by the Inuit. Uh, and he brings to mind, to me, the Holy Spirit. Um, the, because Sila was, was, uh, was known to be um, uh, associated with the the promptings of someone's of your conscience or intuitive warnings and he was said to be always with us and yet far away and in mm -hmm. some traditions he was said to have sculpted the first humans from wet sand and then breathed life into them uh well uh in the in the both the old and the new testament whether it's the hebrew uh the word for spirit uh, which literally means the wind, or in the New Testament, the Greek word for spirit means wind and breath. And so to, in Heart Set Free, this um, a sila uh, serves as a bridge in the workings of the Holy Spirit and the lives of, of Yura and Luke. But the characters um, are, uh, several of them uh, in the book are Catholics. There are two pastors who are more or less in the Reformed Protestant tradition. That's not my tradition. They're two of the heroes. Um, and the character who probably most closely parallels my own beliefs uh, is a young woman who is a, uh, a prophetess. Uh, she knows when water are going to flow through the dry uh, uh, riverbeds, the arroyos in the, in the desert in Nevada. Uh, and she is a clearly a, a believer in universal reconciliation, what the, the Orthodox would refer to as a, a, a pocket uh, a testesis, the restoration of all things, uh, the, the idea that there is no such thing as an eternal hell, that, which would be a defeat for God, but uh, who is a perfect father who desires that none be lost, but all saved. And one thing uh, I'll, I'll just... Um, answer your question one other uh, raising one other point which is that in the, in the book I talk about and you know, we talk about saved so what does that what does that even mean what is what does salvation mean what is what does it mean to say you're saved and I think that in the the fundamentalist or the evangelical uh, tradition uh, too often it just means well you don't have to go to hell and you get to go to heaven when you die and but 
that almost almost uh, trivializes is the wrong word, uh, I think, but I think it's fundamentally wrong way to, to, to look at what it means to be saved. What we're saved from is sin, which is a living death in, in this life. Uh, salvation um, is nothing less than what the Orthodox call theosis, a likeness to or oneness with God. And eternal life, one of the, at one point there's a conversation between the characters where they talk about what, is, what does eternal life mean? Well, the, the Bible tells us, the New Testament tells us that eternal life is knowing God. So it's a kind of life. Yes, it's true you live forever, but if you only live forever, that would be, that'd be hell itself if it, were, if it were not that you are one with God, you, that you know God. It's a kind of life, and it's in fact, it's a kind of life we can live now. And that's one of the, the uh, a very joyous recognition that two of the heroes in this uh, novel come to. I want to talk about this notion of universal reconciliation, which is a new one for me. Um, you know, I, um, like a lot of people in America, grew up um, in a Christian household. Well, that's kind of not exactly true. But in any event, um, my impression, the thing which I don't like about Christianity is this, you know, just exactly what you talked about. You've got to like do it this way or, or no way or you're, or you're going to go to hell forever or something. But also this notion of, um, um, I guess I'll call it trying to convert everybody into your kind of way of thinking. And um, I'm certainly no scholar on universal reconciliation, but um, when, when I read your blog post, um, it really resonated with me as um, maybe a deeper way of looking at this. Can, can you say a little bit about what, what, what universal reconciliation means and uh, how it might be useful to um, um, I guess people that are not Christian. Let's just put it that way. Sure, sure. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying what it doesn't mean. I mean, it's certainly not the same as, as relativism and saying everybody's truth is, is um, whatever, whatever you think uh, is true is, is, is true. Um, as a uh, uh, Christians who, are, who believe in, in universal reconciliation, um, also believe that uh, Jesus Christ is the most is the most perfect uh, the the for for human uh, con consciousness is the most perfect representation of the character of God. Um, that being said, uh, one of the things that that scripture tells us is that God is, is present. Uh, you don't have to, you don't have to read a Bible to, to know that, that God exists. There are, there are truths that, that we can come to. And that in fact, I think underlie are the, are the most important truths that underlie all of the major faiths. Um, the, the idea that, that uh, I, I sometimes think of the, the fundamentalist or even evangelical version of God is I call him the God of the DMV. You know, it's kind of like you go to the department of motor vehicle vehicles and you're waiting a long line. If you haven't filled out your form exactly right, you're, you're, you're in big trouble. Well, that's, that's not the God of, of love. Um, universal reconciliation says that, that we, we have, uh, we began with a perfect creation uh, there were there was a fall. Things went wrong. Why did it? Why did they go wrong? Well, God granted us free will. We're made in the image of God. Image of God. Most important part of that uh, is uh, the free will that we were given, uh, and uh, it was the misuse of that free will that that led to this to the sorry state that we're in today. But eventually, uh, the perfection of creation will be restored. Not in part. But entirely, that means that all created beings, we're all created, everyone from, from the holiest uh, saint to the worst sinner uh, is, a, is a child of God uh, and will eventually uh, willingly turn uh, uh, to him. Um, and not, obviously not necessarily in this, in this life, uh, but, uh, but eventually. Uh, so it's the the restoration of a perfect creation 
uh, the fact that all people will will uh, will turn an event um, and uh, um, be lovingly embrace God. God seeks seeks all people. Its question is, will we turn? Will we turn to Him? Um, and there is more important things that are in common between the great faiths uh, than than separate them. So I, I think that that. Uh, uh, the the God who is love. If you know, if you think about, it, I'm gonna uh, I'll take um, the famous episode from the New Testament, First uh, Corinthians 13, uh, which is often uh, called the the ode to love uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote um, when he says, uh, uh, "Faith, hope, and love; these three things, but the greatest of them is love." Well, greater than faith, greater than faith. Ma many fundamentalists haven't gotten that, you know, conveniently ignore that. Greater than, than uh, uh, f believing in, uh, you know, what exactly is your theology? How do you spell God? You know, how do you spell the name of God? What, what exactly uh, do you, love is greater than faith. Um, if you, a lot of a lot of things get blunted with time. You know, everyone knows the story of uh, of the Good Samaritan, right? But um, if they forgot uh, what what did what did Samaritan mean when Jesus told that story? If Jesus was telling the parable of the Good Samaritan today, he uh, if he, and he wanted to shock and upset people the way he shocked and upset them when he told the story two thousand years ago, he would probably uh, tell a collection of Christians, uh, the story of the good Muslim. <laughs> and it would be a story of a Muslim who found a Christian lying by the side of the road. Hmm. Two follow-up questions, um, Jess, about this, this whole universal reconciliation thing. It, would, would it be fair to say that this is sort of a minority viewpoint among Christ Christians? Uh, it's fair to say that uh, certainly today. It didn't used to be that way. Um, uh, it was in the early church, it was, uh, um, if not a majority, then probably uh, close to it, uh, who, who had that uh, viewpoint. And this at, a, this at a time when Christians were um, uh, everywhere, uh, were as intensely persecuted as, um, you know, some of them are in, in only in the, you know, North, North Korea, or other parts of the world where if you're caught uh, practicing Christianity, you're, uh, you're killed or tortured. Um, so, you know, great, certainly a great temptation to want to think that your oppressors uh, are going to roast in hell forever. But that's not at all what, uh, uh, what many of the early Christians thought. Uh, why? Because that's, you know, there's many of us who believe that, that scripture tells us that in fact, uh, all people will be united with, uh, with the loving Father heart of God. So I guess my other follow-up question is that, um, you know, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm with you totally um, until, you, until you get to the sort of like the, um, the, I guess the primacy of Jesus Christ, I guess I'll call it, just mm -hmm. to put it bluntly. So, I mean, I'm thinking somebody grows up in a, in a different culture, you know, um, China or something, it has no idea, basically anything about Christ or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to take what you said a little further, it sort of means that this person really is, is disadvantaged in order to um, come to reconciliation or something like that. Personally, I can't accept that. I mean, for me, um, I'm, I'm fine with, um, with Christianity, but the notion that of the, the exclusivity, exclusivity as a way to um, get to God or to um, a rec reconciliation, whatever you want to call it, um, that's where I have a problem. Sure. Well, I, I don't. I don't see it as uh, uh, as as exclusive. Um, the I, I don't see that individual as uh, necessarily being at a. Uh, I guess you could say a disadvantage to the extent that um, that he doesn't have the benefit of uh, uh, of of being a witness to. To Jesus Christ, who is the 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 most um, the perfect representation of the character of God, but the is that 
individual can come even without ever having cracked open a Bible, without having heard a, a minister, can by following the promptings of the Holy Spirit in, in his conscience. Everyone has a conscience. Everyone is given, has a God-given ability to, uh, to live a life of love. There are, there's a commonality at the core of the great theistic uh, uh, traditions. There, is, there are common um, uh, uh, beliefs and emphasis on, uh, uh, on mercy and, uh, and love and kindness. And um, there's no disadvantage. It, it also, we place too great an emphasis also on, on the time frame. You know, what time frame? Look, I spent 50 years uh, as, as, a, as an atheist uh, being blissfully really unaware of, of any, you know, any real knowledge about Jesus Christ. Well, suppose I had died when I was 49 years old. So what? Death is not an obstacle to to God. Um, this this life is a is a uh, is a small part of our of our total existence. So uh, reincarnation is there, Jess? Uh, no, I'm not a, a, a believer in reincarnation, but I'm a believer that uh, uh, that this life is only part of the story. Let me ask you this. Um, one of the things which I thought was fascinating, going to one of your blogs, and maybe we could bring, um, um, we can bring your book into it, is uh, you, you talk about doubt and how doubt is not a bad thing, et cetera. Uh, maybe, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe how it's addressed in the book? Sure. Um, well, doubt is... Doubt is a is is a is a is a very positive thing because it shows that somebody is is thinking and trying to understand. Uh, if you if you simply accept what you're what you're given, you know, I go to Sunday school, I go to church, I accept what I'm, what I'm told. Then all of a sudden, one day, something terrible happens, and 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 you've never questioned anything before. And now all of a sudden, everything falls apart. You realize you had no strong basis. So, uh, you know, that's, this is why I begin, uh, for example, I, um, I begin chapter two, as you might remember, with, uh, with David Gold, the uh, Bible school dropout turned uh, uh, boxer, uh, asking, um, uh, do you really think that a loving father could ever be persuaded to slit his own son's throat? Uh, and that's the first sentence of chapter two. And he's referring, of course, to, uh, in the Old Testament, the story of Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham is commanded by God to, to sacrifice his son. And, um, so, you know, a good example of he's wrestling. These are the same questions. He, David Gold and the questions he wrestles with and some of the other characters reflect some of the same things I wrestled with as a, uh, as a Christian. How you know? How do you how do you deal with something like that? How how? And now at one point, early on in the book, it seems like uh, David has bought into the sort of generic uh, mainstream Christian rationale that uh, that seems seems to be on the surface what the Bible is saying that God is testing Abraham's faith. But by the end of the book. Um, but I want, I, I'm hoping that the readers is perhaps not content with that. And uh, one of my character, one of the main characters, Luke, the native Alaskan uh, uh, youth who by the end of the book is, uh, is uh, uh, in his early 20s, um, he's just not happy with that answer. This is just, this just seems needlessly cruel. And uh, I have... Uh, the Catholic uh, priest, uh, real life character George Lemaitre, uh, uh, saying, "You know, I, I I really agree with the young man. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Uh, an omniscient God would know uh, 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 the level of Abraham's faith. It was a test, not to for God to learn about Abraham, but for Abraham to learn about God at a time." 4,000 years ago, when child sacrifice was all too common, uh, and whatever god, local god you happen to worship might very well ask you to sacrifice your child, 
what the, 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 the true God is making a point that that's not how he operates. That's not uh, anything that the God of love would ever ask, uh, uh, would ever want a father to do. Uh, and so Abraham learns about the character of God, uh, not, not the other way around. So it's an example of, of sort of, you know, uh, uh, how characters wrestle with doubt and then by, and so sometimes you can be intimidated, right? From, 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 uh, from expressing uh, doubt. Doubt can be a, a hard thing to admit to if you're, if you're hanging around other believers and you know, are you gonna seem weak? Are you gonna seem like, you know, maybe you're not really gonna fit in? But in fact, it's, it's an incredibly healthy, uh, healthy thing and it ends up leading to a much more secure and well-grounded uh, faith. So I know this is a, maybe a difficult question for an, an author to answer. You're a creative writer. You're, you're quite good. I mean, I was, I was actually, I didn't read the whole thing, but I was very impressed with the, obviously you was a good writer. It was, no, it was clear to me reading what I read. Um, what, would you like, what would you like readers um, of, of Heart Set Free to get out of their book? What would you like them to? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that, uh, now, aside from, I hope enjoying a, a good story. <laughs> um, what I would hope um, is that the spirit in which the characters talk about uh, scripture uh, would rub off on them. I mean, there there are a number of very passionate conversations that take place in the book, sometimes from from different points of view, and these characters are asking, you know, how can they? How can they free themselves from whatever is holding them back from what they're, what they feel like they ought to be doing, which is loving God with all their heart and their strength and their soul, and their mind? And you know, so, so the example I gave from from uh, uh, the doubt that, that David Gold has about the, the Abraham and Isaac story is holding him back. The um, uh, but the point is that that these aren't matters of abstract theology. They're they're, these characters are, are pondering and debating the practical implications for how they ought to live their lives. And so, you know, for example, there's a young woman who's, who had been abused by her father uh, as, a, as a child. And, you know, she wonders, forgiveness is a big, big deal for Christians, right? And so what does it mean that she, that she, has, that, uh, that she has to forgive them? What, as a practical, you know, on a practical basis, what does that actually mean? And there's, you know, many things like that in the book. And what I hope is that Heart Sets Free inspires readers to do the same thing, uh, to this, engage in this sort of passionate exploration of what it means to, uh, uh, to, to follow Christ. Well, talking to you makes me want to read the book. So it's been <laughs> successful as that, uh, from that point of view. But I just want to ask you one last question, Jess. Uh, you know, these are pretty confusing times, I think. You know, there are times I don't even want to turn on the news. In fact, I fast from news um, very often um, because of all the crazy things that, at least to me, look like going on. Me Tell too. me a little about about your 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 personal religious or spiritual practice or, or the kind of things you do to to sustain yourself. Sure. Well, w one of the things I, I find myself doing is turning increasingly sort of a Countercultural, or you know, away away from from the culture. The the working title for my next novel is uh, the Church on Misfit Row, huh. and one of the things I think about a lot is the fact that if you in fact are take what Jesus said seriously, the Sermon on the Mount seriously, then you're going to be a total misfit in American society. Look, I grew up like a lot of people probably. I mean, I loved Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns, and you know. Uh, the uh, action shoot 'em up movies and and whatnot and uh, you know after nine eleven I was you know all in favor of of striking back at the um, the terrorists uh, and um, I uh, I was a uh, in fact a, a politically very conservative I was as you probably figured out a 
uh, capitalist pig. Um, and, <laughs> um, it's not mine. <laughs> well, <there. laughs> uh, well I, I pretty much have, I'm increasingly changing everything about my life. I, first of all, I turned off listening to uh, political talk radio. That's like, that was, that was one of the earliest, like, you know, light bulb went on. This is, does not help. Um, I, uh, went from, uh, I'm becoming in, increasingly the opposite of a political conservative. Um, um, so uh, my politics have become you know, more and more, uh, you know, tending to extreme liberalism. Uh, I got rid of all my guns and ammo. Uh, I'm increasingly uh, a pacifist. Um, and uh, even, even, you know, that probably makes me a misfit even among many, uh, a large portion of the, you know, certainly the religious right, um, which uh, is a big supporter of, um, you know, the American um, uh, military and, and uh, you know, we, we have on our currency in God we trust. No, we don't. We trust in, our, in, in military might and uh, in a strong economy. And um, so, you know, the, the Orthodox uh, have a saying, uh, there's no other way to be saved except through our neighbor. And, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus told us how he will, he will judge us. He's going to say, hey, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? You know, I'm the homeless guy in the street. So I'm trying to, to you know, in however feeble a way, uh, live a life that, that um, is more than about an intellectual uh, set of beliefs about God, but rather am I actually – you know, doing anything to live a life of love. Um, I've, uh, um, so, you know, personally, what do I, uh, some of the things I get involved in is, is, uh, um, think programs that help, uh, homeless youth or, or kids who've been in, in, uh, foster care, or whatnot have been the, the type of charities that, uh, or nonprofit organizations that I've either been on the board of or, or, or tend to, uh, to support and uh, uh, in the last couple of years have adopted a uh, adopted an 11 year old uh, child. Um, so that's uh, so I, I got a long you, way to go. You talk about prayer um, in your in your yeah. in your book. Do you have a a, a prayer for life? I mean, do you do what personal things do you do if any? I mean, yeah. all the things you're talking about sound wonderful, but I'm kind of looking for sure. Just wondering what you do. Yeah, on on, uh, on sort of a private spiritual basis, um, a prayer uh, is um, I, I talk about it a lot. In fact, in the uh, in the novel, because it's something that I think people people struggle with. Uh, a lot of times, you can feel like you know what am what am I doing? You know, praying. You know, I've just published a blog post uh, in the last couple of days on prayer and the silence of God, um, and. Uh, um, but I, I try to do as, uh, as much prayer as, as I can. Um, Paul, uh, apostle Paul told us to pray continuously. That's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm not there yet, but, uh, I'm trying to get there. Well, Jess, I really appreciate it. I mean, I, I want to give a shout out to your website, uh, just, just your name, JessLetterman.com. Um, the book is available everywhere, heart set free. And, um, uh, Thank you so much for being my guest, and uh, you know I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks, Angelo. I had a good time. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>